Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. For a while I've been using the three-legged bar stool metaphor. We need to declare a climate change emergency. The climate system is destabilizing. We're undergoing abrupt climate change. It's going to have enormous implications around the world. In fact, it already is having enormous implications. If you've seen some of my previous videos, um, I use an analogy of a three-legged bar stool. So leg one is we need to zero fossil fuel emissions. Leg two, we need to apply solar radiation management techniques to cool the Arctic. And leg three is carbon dioxide removal. We need to apply carbon dioxide removal methods to lower the CO2 levels in the atmosphere to get rid of ocean acidification and to stabilize the climate. Please share this video as widely as possible. Have a look at my website, paulbeckwith.net, uh, Paul and there's a please donate button on the menu bar on my website. Please consider helping me out financially to get this message out. Um, it's self-funded um, and uh, anything would would help any any anything would help me so the three-legged bar stool has to be implemented as much as possible so like i said leg one is zeroing fossil fuel emissions it's what paris was talking about trying to keep the planet below two degrees celsius and that was changed to 1.5 degrees celsius so let me go into the, some of the details of how we zero fossil fuel emissions so if you just if you um, so if you just Google you know three-legged bar stool climate you come across um, my video which I did back in March three-legged bar stool for surviving climate change was the title um, as I say here we must immediately declare a global climate change emergency and deploy the metaphorical three-legged bar stool solutions to stabilize the climate. Okay, so the first part is zeroing fossil fuel emissions on an emergency basis. So you've probably noticed that there's a large increase in the talk about zeroing, about reducing fossil fuel emissions. So um, just back in September of last year, um, this article talks about the divestment campaign. I haven't seen a lot about that recently but the momentum has been building a worldwide movement to di divest from fossil fuels. Um, 430 investment firms and companies and over 2,000 individuals have so far pledged to withdraw investments from fossil fuels. So that's about 2.6 trillion in assets. Um, it is a lot higher than that because the momentum has been, has been um, gaining for this type of method. Okay, so that's only one part of the um, what we can do. So let me bring up a sheet here. So the if you go to Google Citizens Climate Lobby, and you can get lots of information on the pros and cons of of uh, carbon fee and dividend versus carbon cap and trade. There's different ways, those are the two main methods, putting a tax on carbon versus car creating a market to trade in carbon and then lowering the total size of the market to lower uh, emissions. But it, the easiest thing to implement, the thing that we know works, it works great in Vancouver and other places around the world is a carbon tax. Um, carbon fee and dividend, the dividend would go back to people and that makes sure that it's the heavy fossil fuel users that pay the the, the um, highest prices. Um, you know, they're causing the biggest part of the problem. So this, um, so carbon fee and dividend is by far the best way to go. But what's the point of putting a tax on carbon or running carbon trade, cap and trade, if we're giving subsidies to fossil fuel companies these subsidies are like negative taxes, if you like. We're just giving them money. So how big are these energy subsidies? Well, this if you consider the, um, if you add in, try to add in some externalities related to air pollution, et cetera, and, and the taxes, we're talking about almost $2 trillion. 
and it's divided into different regions like this. Um, I can show this in a um, in some pie charts here. So this is advanced countries. This is a 1.9 trillion, almost two trillion advanced. So these are subsidies um, to the fossil fuel industry, enormous subsidies. Um, they're even higher than this because this is data, I think this is data in 2011 based on, on a 2013 report um, from the International Energy Agency or the International Monetary Fund. Actually, it's uh, the, o the um, OECD, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, um, some big German banks, the IMF, World Economic Outlook, and the World Bank. So, so we have advanced countries here. This is Central and Eastern Europe and Commonwealth of Independent States. Um, this is Asia, emerging and developing. This is Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is um, the Middle East and North Africa. And then um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see how much subsidies are being given globally. Most of that is uh, petroleum products, including oil. Uh, natural gas is separate here, coal is separate here, and this is subsidies to electricity here. So this report is, uh, I'll just scroll up to the top here, um, go home. So this is the International Monetary Fund report, January 28, 2013. You can try to find something more recent Okay, so, so we have to get rid of these subsidies. That's obvi obvious. We have to do that first. We, then we have to apply the, the cap, cap and trade or fee and dividend. Fee and dividend being preferential, being much more effective. This paper um, in Science Daily says fossil fuels could be phased out worldwide in a decade. So it's a new study. Um, what it does is you know, we'll look at it, I'll bring it up in a minute, but basically what it does is it says, you know, if we wanted to do it, if the political will was there, it, we're not limited by technology. So this is a professor at Sussex Energy Group, you know, it would take a collaborative, interdisciplinary, multi-scalar, multi-scalar effort to do it, and he talks about different transitions in the past, and he talks about what is different now, um, you know, so, so some success stories. For example, moving from wood to coal in Europe took between 96 and 160 years. Moving electricity took 47 to 69 years to become mainstream. Ontario shifted away from coal between 2003 and 2014. Um, in a program in Indonesia, it took three years to move two thirds of the population from kerosene stoves to um, LPG stoves. France's nuclear program went from 4% of the electricity market in 1970 to 40% within 12 years by 1982. So we can do things much faster than, than people think. So this is the actual paper, um, the, the published paper. So um, there's some in interesting figures here. You know, this is, this is uh, 1800, 2000. This is canals being developed. You know, they, they follow this typical S-curve, railways, telegraphs, oil pipelines, roads. You know, now we need to do this to get rid of fossil fuels and go to renewables. And they talk about the time of the speed for phasing out things or something. It talks a lot about the history of, of revolutionary changes in society. And then it indicates um, some of the arguments towards the end of what we can do. You know, some of the success stories, how quickly we can change things once we put our mind to it. And then it argues that, you know, about a decade or so is all that we require. Um, the pain from extreme weather events taking off, you know, threats to the food supply, all of these things will make us go a lot quicker than we think. Um, this is a, a book out, um, you know, a lot of people are thinking about this. This is a book out, um, Our Renewable Future, Laying the Path for 100% Clean Energy. Um, lots of good ideas. You know, it's not any one solution. It's solar, it's wind, perhaps it's advanced nuclear, um, although people don't like that option. It's geothermal, um, it's energy efficiency, 
Um, there's all kinds of things that can be done. It's, uh, you know, different types of um, whatever we can do to uh, replace the energy sources, you know, whether it be, you know, coal, coal's already dying. You know, there's oil, the high cost oil is dying. Um, you know, natural gas has taken up a lot of the slack, but we need to phase out natural gas also. So there's lots of information out there. This is a great site, Only Zero Carbon, lots of great links. It's done by a friend of mine, uh, Peter Carter. There's loads of information here, loads of good quotes. You know, I asked the top scientists, do we really have to get down to near zero? Can't we cut it a half or a quarter? Until we get to near zero, the temperature will continue to rise. This is Bill Gates' quote. Um, we, we don't have a choice. We should be talking about emissions targets, and the right emission target is zero, you know, rather than talking about temperatures, two degrees, one and a half degrees. Um, CO2 emissions must be zero by 2070 to prevent climate disaster, UN says. You know, first it was going to be 2100, and in 27, lots of countries and cities are aiming for 2050, and I showed you the report that says we could do it within 10 years. Okay, so there's lots of, uh, um, you know, 100% renewable energy, if you just look at it, this guy, Mark Jacobs, Jacobson at Stanford, has a plan on how we do this. There's lots of good links here. There's lots of information about different countries. For example, these are places around the world with 100% renewable energy. So populations, different cities and places. And, uh, you know, here's Iceland. You know, 72% hydro, 28% geothermal, wind and solar, less than 0.1% combustible fuel. Okay, Quebec, 99% renewable energy, right? They've got so much hydro. 99% um, renewable is the main energy used, 41%, followed by oil, 38, and natural gas, 10. Okay, um, there's all kinds of different information here. Um, so have a look. Companies, these are 65 companies, major companies that have said they've got a commitment to go 100% renewable including like Swiss Re, Ikea, Adobe, um, many different companies here, even uh, things like uh, Coca-Cola, you know, different banks, etc. You know, industry wants to do this. They recognize, anybody that recognizes a problem wants to do it. So what do we have historically? We had the Marshall Plan. So after World War II, Europe was destroyed, Japan was destroyed. The U.S. set up an initiative to aid Western Europe they gave 12 billion, which would be 120 billion in current dollar value to support and rebuild Europe after the war. You know, massive plan. You know, it was Secretary of State George Marshall was what the initiative was aimed after. Um, in the reconstruction, you know, Europe was totally destroyed, um, basically. You know, took huge amounts. So what happened, um, you know, some of the results, implementation, um, where is it here? Uh, expenditures. Here we go. The years 1948 to 52 saw the fastest period of growth ever in European history. Industrial production increased by 35%. Agriculture production surpassed pre-war levels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a massive plan. It was, uh, you know, implemented to address a big problem. You know, here's another massive project. 1940, from 1942, um, until the uh, H-bombs were dropped, or, or the atomic bombs were dropped, rather. The Manhattan Project was a, a, a huge project um, that started out modestly in 39, employed 130,000 people, cost nearly U U.S. $2 billion, which is $26 billion in 2016 dollars, and uh, basically, you know, had a project with a goal in mind to, to win the war, to end the war. The Apollo program, after Kennedy's speech in May 1961, you know, we'll get a land of man on the moon, return of safety to Earth by the, by the end of the 60s. So that was eight years out, and this was accomplished. Um, you know, we retooled uh, completely during World War II. We stopped building cars, and we built aircraft. This is a Ford plant. Um, there was a... Uh, you know, each different industry, Chrysler had tanks, Hudson's had bombers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, people realized there was a massive